I would just like to welcome everybody along to this evening's Developing Safe Farming Practices, which is a health and safety question and answer session. I'll start by introducing myself. So for you, those of you who don't know me, I'm Annette Marshall, Agricultural Consulting in Perth, um, and I'm facilitating and chairing this meeting tonight. Um, our panellists for the evening are Laura Silvers and Steph Davidson from NFU Mutual's Risk Management Services Limited, and Steph Berkeley. Um, from the Farm Safety Foundation. They'll introduce themselves later on, so that's all the introduction I'm going to give to them. So with all that covered, I'll now pass over to Steph. I'm going to get confused with all these Steph. Stephanie Berkeley from the Farm Safety Foundation. Okay, thanks very much, Annette. Um, thanks for inviting me to be involved in this today. I'm really hoping my internet will hold up. Uh, because it has a habit of playing up, as you know, technology does. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, and let's see if that works. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Yes? Yeah, good. Okay, so um, as Annette said, um, I manage the Farm Safety Foundation, which is an independent registered charity that covers the whole of the UK. Um, and our speciality is obviously clues in the name, farm safety, but also looking after the physical and mental well-being of farmers. So I'm going to start off actually um, with a video, which may sort of let, set the scene about what it is we look at, what it is we cover and what it is we do. I remember going to the back of my car and getting out a light bulb to change the 500 watt halogen in the potato store and then it went blank. I remember waking up in hospital and seeing my wife standing there. I now refer to myself as the Terminator with a titanium head and a titanium spine but I've been very lucky. And farm safety isn't about luck, it's about making sure that you are conscious of farm safety at all times and every job you do. Harry was killed when he was unable to control the traction trailer he was driving on a downward section of road. An HSE investigation found that the trailer had poorly maintained brakes that didn't work. If farmers carried out routine maintenance checks on trailers, including their brakes, tyres and hydraulics, Harry would still be with us. That's why I'm campaigning for change. Farming can be a lonely job when I mean, you have so much time on your own. You tend to overthink. I'm worried about my family, my girlfriend and my friends. I really believed I had to man up, be strong and get on with it. I ended up getting very lonely and experienced serious mental health issues. As a teenager I battled cancer and won, but my mental health battle was probably tougher. I've learnt that no matter how bad things have been in my life, things have always gotten better, but I have to ask for help. Dad was a very experienced and qualified driver who'd been farming for many years. It was a freak accident while he was unstrapping a load of straw in his lorry. Four Heston bales fell off and crushed him to death. It's human nature to think it won't happen to me, but my family are the example that it can, especially if farmers continue to take risks. There are things we can all do to stay safe so we can come home to the people we love every day. We are real people. These are real stories. Let's make a real change. For more information on Farm Safety Week and to read my story, visit yellowwellies.org or follow at Yellowwellies UK on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. So that is basically just one of the things that we do. You might know us as the Farm Safety Foundation. You might also know us as Yellow Wellies. Um, that's our logo. We're symbolised by basically who would fill your boots because it's not just about you. It's about everybody that's involved in any kind of farm incident, um, life changing or life ending incident. The thing is, we were set up actually by NFU Mutual, the insurance company, as an independent charity to look after farm safety, not just during Farm Safety Week, but each and every day of the year. We actually work very closely with the next generation of farmers to educate and inspire them to challenge and to change those behaviours that are continuing to give farming 
the poorest safety record of any occupation in the UK. We do that through education. We work very closely with SRUC. We work very closely with the Scottish Association of Young Farmers Clubs and the National Farmers Union to deliver farm safety training and mental wellbeing training right throughout um, their network, whether or not it's the Young Farmers Club network or to the various campuses at SRUC. I just did something with Wallace Curry and the team uh, down at Dumfries and Galloway two days ago. Um, also engagement. Engagement is about making friends. It's working with people like RSABI, like the Mind Your Head uh, charity in the Shetland Islands, you know, people like that, that can help deliver those messages because there's only three of us in the charity. And, you know, we've only got limited resources, but also to understand how important it is to get those messages right and in the right tone. Communication, obviously, is all about that. We use our Farm Safety Week and our Mind Your Head campaigns, which are annual week-long campaigns to do that, deliver the messages. But also we use social media a lot because we know a lot of our um, audience is on social media, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, or whether or not it's Twitter itself. We have about 36,000 followers, so we're able to share those messages in a real and relatable way, totally unpreachy, because farmers know what they're doing, you know, but we're just there as a gentle reminder to you know, keep looking after themselves. And also research. We do research every terms of farmers. We also do to the larger audience as well. But we work closely with people like the University of Aberdeen School of Psychology to understand things like situation awareness when it comes to uh, managing tiredness and rushing and also understanding why farmers don't wear, you know, ATV helmets when they're on their ATVs, something that so fundamentally could actually save their life. Why aren't they doing it? So we need to understand what the reasons they're giving us so that we can challenge those. So we know nearly half a million people work in the industry in the UK. 1.5% of the overall working population, but actually agriculture accounts for 20% of all workplace deaths. That's disproportionate. It does have the poorest safety record of any occupation. It's 18 times more dangerous than in the industry average. In 2019, 2020, there were 20 uh, farm workers who lost their lives as a result of going to work. One member of the public, a four-year-old child, and unfortunately, as we know, farming is still the only industry that continues to be the place where children lose their lives and which is always a tragic um, accident for families, communities, friends. You know, it affects everybody. The ripple effect of an accident or a fatality will be felt by a lot of people. And when we talk about stats and numbers, we've got to remember these are people's families. These are people that are not going to be there at the dinner table at Christmas. So we need to be very sensitive to that. And I know um, the RMS guys are going to talk about the five-year average, but this is what caused the, uh, the injuries last year. Third of them were moving vehicles. This year, it will be some, it'll be similar. It will be a third of them will be as a result of workplace transport. 19% were as a result of falls from height, struck by an object, injured by animals. 11 of the fatals this year will be as a result of coming into contact with uh, cattle. Five of them will be members, members of the public. So these are messages that we need to use to remind people of all the dangers that they face each and every day. 10% of all accidents, fatal accidents last year happened in Scotland. In brackets, you'll find the year before. So there has been a massively renewed emphasis on farm safety in Scotland by NFU Scotland, by the Scottish Association of Young Farmers Clubs, and obviously um, by SRUC for their students as well. So it's you see when that renewed effort happens, the results can be good. There are two fatalities that are still too, too many, you know, so we want to get that to zero. That is not a massively lofty ambition, you know, to have zero avoidable deaths in the industry and it's something we all need to do our bit to actually drive forward. In Scotland, it's 80% of Scotland's land mass, mass is under agricultural production. You know, it's the single biggest determinant of the landscape. Around us. They actually contribute 2.9 billion pounds a year in terms of output and, and produce, uh, which really contributes to the agri food industry in Scotland. And 67,000 people are directly employed in agriculture, 8% of the rural workforce. 
So it's really important that we do realise the significance of it, not just to us and to our communities, but actually to the Scottish economy as well. But if something goes wrong, what could it cost the business? Well, it'll cost them sickness payments, recruitment and having to get new staff in and train them, loss of output, key staff off work, replacements not as effective, you're not able to carry out that weather critical work, the damage actually that causes the machinery, buildings, equipment, the admin costs, the insurance costs, obviously legal, and obviously you do not want to be on the front cover of Scottish Farmer, and you could be prosecuted, and that's an issue as well. But what could, what could it cost you? You could have a life-changing injury or a disability or worse. You could develop long-term mental health and um, ill health issues. And we know that there are 14,000 um, long-term illnesses that is, are, are resulted every year as a result of going to farm, um, into farming. And that could be anything from musculoskeletal to skin cancer to um, zoonosis to you know, any of those kind of things. There's also the loss of earning, her employment prospects, the impact, and again, prosecution, because you may be the victim, but also you're the person that could be prosecuted. And of course, as something that we're very much aware of, the mental health issues that come as a result of it. We know two farm workers died in Scotland 2019 or 2020, according to the Health and Safety Executive Report, but there were 31 suicides registered in Scotland and those working in farming and agricultural related trades in the same year, according to national records of Scotland. Why is that? Farmers are at the mercy, they're so good at looking after landscape, their livestock and everything else, but not so good at looking after themselves. They put themselves at the very bottom of the list. How many times have you heard a farmer say, don't go up that ladder to fix that roof, it's too dangerous, I'll do it. This is what they do, this is why we love farmers but it's also the most frustrating thing is that they do put themselves down and they don't realize that they are the farm's biggest asset if they're not in the right headspace they can be the farm's biggest liability as well they're also affected by so many stressors that are out of their control as well as everything that the general public have to put up with they're at the mercy of the weather financial issues taking on significant debt to to farm and to buy land and to buy livestock they're also at the mercy of international trade agreements politics, Brexit, all of that uncertainty around the new agriculture bill, working on their own all day, rural isolation is a massive issue. Where they live also means sometimes that there's no escape for them. But the help is there. This is the one thing that we try to do, especially with the Mind Your Head campaign, is let people know that there are fantastic farm and rural support groups out there. You know, that and we've got a resource on the website that can actually guide people through to somewhere in their area. And we know that no matter what help they need, face to face, by phone, online, in a forum, a web based platform, there is something for everybody. So there will be something that will suit your means and the way you want to communicate with somebody. And of course, we've got RSABI in Scotland. You know, RSABI are an amazing organization that we work with very closely, and they can help you with any of those issues whether you've been the victim of a farm accident, they can help you through that. They can, if you've got an illness, if you're feeling isolated, if you want somebody to talk to, if you want to talk about rural, um, or sorry, succession planning, all of that kind of thing, they're there. They have got an amazing amount of people that are qualified and can actually help you and hold your hand while you get the help you need. And also Scottish Association of Young Farmers Clubs were one of the first people out there to actually pioneer the issue of mental ill health in farming. You know, their Are You OK campaign was an award-winning campaign long before the noise around mental health started. And actually before we started our Mind Your Head campaign, you know, they inspire people. So they can there, be there to support their members and other people to offer advice, you know, and highlight the factors that contribute to uh, rural isolation. So from our point of view, the next big thing for us is Farm Safety Week. It happens on the 19th to the 23rd of July. I'm really hoping you all get involved. And our theme this year is Rethink Risk because the things that have, that have actually caused the accidents for those farmers over the last 60 years, and you'll probably hear it from the RMS team as well, they have not changed. In 60 years, the same things that were killing people 60 years ago are killing our farmers now. You know, So we need to rethink the way we approach risk. That's pretty much what I'm up to. So I will pass over to the next uh, speaker and I will put myself on mute. 
Thank you very much, Stephanie. I think Laura will get her slides up in a wee second and we'll pass on to to the NFUS Risk Management Services. Thanks very much for having us along tonight. Um, my name's Laura and I'm here with my colleague, Steph Davidson. We both work for the NFU Mutual's Health and Safety Department and um, Steph is one of our health and safety consultants. If you haven't heard of us before, we are an uh, independent health and safety consultancy owned by the NFU Mutual. We have 80 risk management consultants that work for us, um, 50 of them specialise in the health and safety side. So Steph is one of our health and safety consultants based in Scotland. We focus on agricultural health and safety and do everything from site inspections and audits to health and safety training um, to some more specialist services. So Steph and our consultants are out on farms every day trying to help our customers manage their health and safety in a practical way. Most people we speak to are doing the right things, but don't always have the kind of evidence that would help back them up if anything ever went wrong. But really, our focus is trying to provide practical advice. It's very different dealing with health and safety um, outside on a farm than it is inside in a factory, for example, or working with livestock can be, can be completely different than working um, on a factory line. So Steph is going to have a couple of slides here to take you through a little bit about um, some of the most common things that we see on the health and safety side and a little bit about where you can find some really useful information. I'm assuming Laura's going to take over control for me there on the slides. <laughs> She's got hold of them. Um, yeah, obviously, I know Stephanie's already touched on this a wee bit for us, but why we manage health and safety. Obviously, we're looking after our employees. Nobody wants anybody to be injured within their employee. Um, but as Stephanie touched on, we often see farmers doing the dangerous jobs. I often hear farmers telling me, I don't let my staff go up on roofs. I don't let them go into the confined space. I do the dangerous stuff. And they're just as important as anybody else's. Obviously, have the legal aspect. We've got the Health and Safety at Work Act, which is our prime piece of legislation, which requires us to manage health and safety. And there's an awful lot under that that we find, as Laura just said, having that documentation in place to protect you. We see people managing risk on a daily basis, but they don't necessarily have that documentation to back up and prove that they've done what they're required to do. Obviously, as Stephanie touched on earlier, there are all the different costs involved in accidents. There's the insurable costs, things like compensation claims made against you should somebody have an accident on your site. But there's, there's the uninsured side of things. You can't insure against fines from criminal prosecutions, for example. And something we'll touch on a little bit later is obviously the HSC, the Health and Safety Executive, are now able to do fees for intervention should they come out to site and find what they term a material breach of a regulation. Can I have the next slide, please, Laura? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stephanie obviously touched on last year's accident figures. We have the five-year average um, for you here. And as she mentioned, it's the same things we see every year that are still causing a problem for us. It's vehicle issues, generally maintenance of vehicles, ensuring people are trained on them, ensuring people are wearing any personal protective equipment they should be wearing. Helmets on ATVs is the classic one. Farmers will often tell me they have a helmet. They're not always wearing it, though, unfortunately. Killed by animals. We see an awful lot of injuries involving livestock, cattle and bulls in particular. And I know there's been a, an increase with injuries involving members of the public, particularly during these lockdown periods with people dog walking through livestock fields. And it's being aware of your responsibilities as a farmer to suitably sign public access points into fields, make sure the temperament of your cattle is OK. Any aggressive animal should be disposed of or certainly not put into fields with public access. We're still seeing falls from height, unfortunately. Um, lots of people still doing roof work, cleaning of gutters, things like that. Not necessarily having suitable work at height equipment. Using ladders that perhaps have seen better days, that kind of thing. And we're unfortunately still seeing people killed by contact with machinery. 
So it isn't just being run over. It is things like not practicing safe stop. I'm sure you're all aware of the safe stop procedure, but it's engines off, gear in neutral, handbrake on, key in pocket if you need to leave the vehicle. You certainly shouldn't be trying to check on PTO shafts or any blockages or anything like that on attachments or cultivation equipment without turning that engine off. Can I have the next slide, please, <laughs> Laura? Thank you. As I mentioned there, it's the, the four prime things there, falls from height, livestock, transport and equipment that we're still seeing issues with on farms. And it's still the same things that are killing farmers that were doing so 60 years ago. Health and safety executive have just restarted their visits on site, looking at farm safety. The ones I've heard of recently have been focusing on lifting equipment, training on vehicles and livestock. That is something to look at on your own farms and see if you've got any issues there. I mentioned the fee for intervention. They're now charging £160 an hour if they come on your site and find a material breach. Um, and they will charge that for however long it takes them to investigate. It can unfortunately rack up into thousands of pounds. Some really good information can be found on the HSE website if you look for the FarmWise booklet or what a good farm looks like booklet, or we'll give you some really useful information. And there is also free information available from the NFU Mutual website. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, the first question that's come through is kind of related to just what you finished on. So it probably goes to Steph Davidson, this one. Um, it's what is entailed in a health and safety inspection? When's a caution risk required and what documents would they, would they expect to find? I know this could be a never ending one. So if it could be a fairly short answer, that would be great. A health and safety inspection from the HSC? Yes, I think so. I think that's it. I mean. Yeah. Um, if it's the HSC coming on, on site, uh, it honestly depends on what they're looking for. Generally, they will give you a clue when they, when they phone up. They are being quite good about phoning up and giving you a few days notice. Doesn't always happen. They can do spot checks where they do just turn up. But invariably, they'll turn up with a particular thing in mind. So it might be that they've come out to look at livestock or training for example they'll generally have a walk around your site though and if there's anything else they see they, they may pick up on in terms of documentation once you have five or more employees you do need to have things like risk assessments and cost assessments written down certainly the significant risks anyway and you also need to have your health and safety policy statement in place that answer the question i think yeah i think so they'll come back if um if you're looking for more. Yeah. <laughs> um, still on that, can you possibly repeat what the health and safety executive visits are particularly looking at at the moment? I think uh, yes, she didn't catch that, so if you could just repeat uh, that quickly. They're looking at livestock um, in terms of both handling within cattle courts and similar, um, also in fields. As I mentioned, there's been a few issues there. Um, they're also looking at machinery in terms of maintenance, lifting equipment in terms of making sure any statutory inspections that are required are in place for things like telehandlers, forklifts, man cages. And then they're also looking at training documentation, making sure all the employees have had the training they need to drive the vehicles that they're operating. Um. Next one, it's probably still we used to have. How can farmers in Scotland okay. keep cattle in fields without public access when the Scottish Outdoor Access Code the yeah. way it is? What's the best practice to manage risk? Even the most quiet animal can um, can turn loopy when calving or. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's a it's a real issue for us up here in Scotland with that whole right to roam. What the best advice is, is if you are able to keep any livestock in fields away from where you know the public are generally walking through, that's the best option. Obviously, we're aware that the public can go anywhere um, in Scotland. But if you know that there's one or two fields that they're accessing more than off, more frequently than others, try and keep your livestock out of there if you can. 
If you can't, um, one of the things the HSE advise is if you're able to fence off a public walkway through the field, then that's great. That's not always feasible. At the very least, just have suitable signage on the access gates entering the field, just warning people there's livestock, warning of cows and calves, warning of bulls, uh, warning of pregnant sheep during lambing season, because obviously you don't want pregnant females going into the, the field in case of toxoplasmosis and similar. And then just maintaining fences. If you've got electric fences in place as well, make sure you've got your signage on the electric fence every 50 metres. And really, it's just with a lot of health and safety, it's just keeping an eye on things. If you start to see any issues, you might want to reassess the situation. Um, so, <laughs> you are really getting this there. Um, what HSE it's going to be more light, isn't it? It's fine. I think, I think the thing is, it's a lot of the legislation side that, that people are worried about and want more clarity on. So, yeah. What HSC oh, requirements yeah. are needed for a business with less than five employees or just a one man band? Okay. So, you still need to carry out your risk assessments, your cost assessments, um, but you don't have to keep it written down legally. However, it is something we'd always advise us to keep a written copy of risk assessments because otherwise you can't prove that you've done it. It's one of those loopholes, unfortunately, that you get with the HSE is them saying you don't have to write it down, but then how do you prove you did it? Um, certainly any significant risks, uh, for example, working at height, definitely have a, a risk assessment for that. And then in terms of any other legal requirements it's things like making sure your equipment is well maintained any statutory inspections are carried out um, and then any training that you require is in place and what should be covered in a risk assessment within reason you're looking at significant risks so you don't want to be looking at things necessarily like walking across the farmyard and tripping over a cable Yes, that is a risk, but it's a relatively low one. What you should be looking at is what are the hazards, who might be harmed and how, and what control measures you can put in place to prevent that accident from happening. So, for example, you want to be looking at livestock handling. Ideally, you're not doing that as a lone worker if you can possibly avoid it. Um, things like marking out and bedding, you want to be trying to do that mechanically where you can to reduce manual handling risk. If you're having to do gutter cleaning, you want to be looking at safe means of access, so preferably not going up a ladder, certainly not doing what we still unfortunately see some farms doing, which is climbing into the bucket of the digger or various other items like pallets and tatty boxes being used instead of working platforms, that sort of thing. I'm very conscious that I can start just waddling on about things like this. So I'm trying to get free. Um, right, this is a bit of a different vein. Companies are worried about employees with no win, no fees claimed. If an employee has an accident in spite of having a training certificate, et cetera, proving that they're competent in that skill, that's a give less blame to the business. Like if they're using well-equipped... Um, well-maintained tools and forklifts, quad bike, etc. And how long do they have to make a claim after the incident? I'm going to probably get corrected here slightly because I'm not that up on things like claims, but generally I believe it's within three years of an injury occurring or becoming aware of ill health caused by the injury. Don't quote me on that though, that's a bit bit dodgy. Um, yes, generally, I mean, what, what you have under Health and Safety at Work Act, as the farmer, as the employer, you have a duty of care to your employees and members of the public. But also under that act, employer, sorry, again, employees themselves have a duty of care to look after themselves and also others. So yes, if they're competent, they've been trained, they've been told how to use the equipment, yes, they have a responsibility to then be using it safely. What you tend to find in general, if an accident occurs, our, a claim is made, whilst a, a judge may award compensation to the claimant, 
they'll often knock off a percentage depending on how much of the blame is on the claimant themselves. So, for example, if the person has been trained, they've been told how to use a piece of equipment correctly and they were doing something they shouldn't have been doing, they may be awarded um, the claim for the injury, but they'll then find it's discounted down by up to 80, 90 percent because they were held 90 percent responsible for the accident. This one might be one to move to Stephanie. And what's the most common actual incident that you see and probably the most common avoidable incident that you have come across? You're on mute, Stephanie. Oh, is that for me or for the other Stephanie? The other Stephanie. <laughs> we'll let her um, no. have a turn. <laughs> Except it might be you, Steph Davidson, because Stephanie seems to have um, frozen on us. <laughs> okay, my oh. internet is horrific at the minute. I apologise. I keep getting a message saying it's unstable. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, we can hear you now. Right. So the, the avoidable, all the accidents are avoidable, and that's the one thing HSE will tell you, that... Most, if not all, of the accidents that happen on farms are actually avoidable. There are things that you can do. There are dynamic risk assessments that you can make before every accident. But unfortunately, a lot of the people that are actually having these, um, these fatal injuries are older. They're older farmers that may have got into habit. So there is an issue of habit forming. There's also a reliance on luck which a lot of um, farmers don't seem to realize that the risks that there were on the farm yesterday may have changed overnight. So walking on to the end of the yard compared to yesterday when it may be raining overnight will cause slip hazards, will you know, cause a whole different issue. You know, so that it is that issue of actually doing those risk assessments, whether they be dynamic and then relying on the, the written one but also having the contingency there to be able to go about their work, doing their pre-start checks on their ATV, wearing their helmet, wearing their high vis, making sure the visor's down. If it's to do with, you know, the with you know livestock, livestock, making sure that the people that are um, working with livestock are agile and trained to do so, that the races and the crush are properly maintained, you know, that the animals are you're understanding the behaviors of the animals that you're dealing with that and it's it all goes back actually to that health and safety at work act is that it's there for a reason it's there to protect people it's there to remind them how important they are and to carry out those risks and make sure that only people that are trained or undergoing supervised training are actually working on that it's not letting your children ride on AT, on um, agricultural vehicles you know if they're under 13 years of age you know they can't be a passenger on it they can't ride on it they certainly can't drive it you know so it, it is thinking about those things and I understand how difficult it is given the practicalities and given the fact that farming has changed over the last 60 years as well there are less people employed which means the onus and the responsibilities of, on, on the people that are actually working in the industry at the minute have changed and the pressures are there so it's seeing what's going to work best for you in order that you're going to come home at the end of the day, which is really, you know, not that big a goal. I think it should be standard for each one of us. Very true. Um, this is probably back to Steph Davidson's. So rules must say a calf must be tagged within a few days of birth. Should you follow the risk assessment and should you follow sort of the, the law? and I'm going to add the bit on because that's an age-old discussion. Do you do any lobbying to get any changes for these kind of things? Um, I, the lobbying bit, I think Laura can probably answer better than I can. Um, but the the calf being tagged, yeah, you're absolutely right. Cows will be a bit protective. I've certainly seen that myself. Um, but what you should be doing is just thinking about how you can safely tag the cow uh, tag the cat excuse me the calf generally you can separate the cow off from the calf that's the best way of doing it um, and just minimize the risk um, 
again, just using the barriers and the gates within the cattle court themselves to just separate them for a moment. But at the end of the day, you need to follow your risk assessment. And it's far better for that calf to remain untagged for a few extra days than it is for you to end up with broken ribs or a broken leg or similar. I don't know if Laura can answer a bit about NFU lobbying for changes. So NFU Scotland probably pick up the actual kind of lobbying side. For the NFU Mutual, a lot of our consultants sit on various um, agricultural health and safety boards. Um, so things like the HSC or IOSH, who are credit health and safety consultants, have um, different working groups for agriculture. So a lot of our consultants are part of that and feedback things that we see the, the guys see on farms, which hopefully helps um, towards improving things on that side of it. But it would actually it would be probably more through NFU Scotland side that they would do the kind of lobbying part of it all. Um. Steph Davidson again, if you employ a reputable company to carry out work, for example, replacing broken sheets on a roof and the worker falls through the roof, who is responsible? As long as you've done your contractor competency checks, then the responsibility very much lies on the contractor. Having said that, the HSC, if the, if the accident happens, the HSC are involved, they will come and talk to you first because it's your site. They will ask to make sure that you've done your contract competency checks. And that can be if you're bringing, um, you know, for example, an electrician on site, you want to make sure they're part of a trade organisation like Select. Ask to see their public liability insurance. Something like roof work, you would ask them to give you a risk assessment of how they're going to do the work safely. Um, you might ask for recommendations from others or references to show that they are competent. And as long as you've done that, um, you should pretty much be safe um, but having having said that you know obviously if they've given you a risk assessment and said they'll do the work one way and you see them doing something entirely dangerous you do need to tell them to stop and remove themselves from the roof until they can follow their own risk assessment we do see that an awful lot unfortunately people handing over a, a template risk assessment that has absolutely no bearing on what they're actually doing up on the roof Um, we'll start with this. This can probably go on to two, two lines. So this Steph Berkeley. If people are looking to educate employees on health and safety and want to make sure the message hits home, especially with a younger employee, is there techniques that you'd recommend to um, that farmers can use either on your website or resources that you have? Yep, um, we have advice pages on our website. We also have um, a booklet, um, a guide to uh, farm safety for young farmers. It's specifically written for young farmers. It covers some of the key issues involved in that. It's on the yellowwellies.org website under the resources page. So we actually have um, three books, one for young farmers, one for parents, actually, to, as a gentle reminder for parents about um, the issues that, that children could face by being on farm. And we obviously had that with lockdown. You know, there were a lot of more a lot more children um, spending more time on farm when they weren't able to go to school. So that was written with that in mind. Also for temporary workers. So, for example, if you're bringing somebody in for the summer, you know, to be picking and to be working on the farm as well at specific times of the year. It's basically written with them in mind, you know, so it's a it's an important thing. But also there are various advice pages. So if you're working with livestock, if you're working at height, if you're working with machinery. So it's just that very gentle reminder about safe stop and employing that if they're actually using agricultural vehicles, making sure they've got, you know, handbrake on, out of gear, engine off you know, keys in pocket, that's your safe stop message. It's very simple, but it's just that very gentle reminder because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of agricultural machines, you know, don't have brains. So use yours kind of thing. You know, if it's got no power going to the piece of machinery, you know, uh, if it's a power takeoff, it's taking power off the engine. If the engine's off, there's no power. So the danger is, uh, is minimized at that stage as well. So, and also if they've got safe stop, chances are if you're working at the back, of um, you know a tractor, somebody can't jump into the cab and not see you, 
you know, um, and, and and head off. And it, so there, there are lots of very simple things that people can do in terms of, you know, young farmers, whether or not they're actually on placement, whether they're apprentices or whether or not they're there for the, you know, learning on the job. Um, and also we're, we're delivering training through the Young Farmers Club. So um, actually a lot, all the young farm, I've trained six farm safety mentors that can do this training. So it's like a 90 minute session that they can get. And also it sort of dovetails as well with the stuff that we're doing at SRUC for their um, agricultural students. So the, the there's a lot of information out there. It's also the stuff that's on our website is written. That's not too technical. Also written with a 16 year old that's left school with not necessarily high levels of literacy in mind. And certainly not, you know, they're time poor as well. They want the information now. They want to know what to do, what not to do, and what could happen if it goes wrong. You know, so that's the way it's written. And on a similar theme, moving on to other staff, is there templates for some of the more legislation, the risk assessments? Is it on somebody that you can provide us on the HSE website? And also that kind of ties into this question is, if you contact HSE, for a query, is that likely to trigger them coming out for an inspection? Answer the second bit first. Yes, it can, unfortunately. Um, it shouldn't do. Ideally, you'd be able to phone the HSC and just ask a question, but it can sometimes trigger an inspection depending on how you've phrased the question and what the topic is that you're asking about, <laughs> unfortunately. In terms of templates, yes, NFU Mutual themselves, uh, we have a a website for small businesses or a web page, I should say. I don't know if Laura can pass that on at the end. And that's got free risk assessment templates, cost assessment templates, um, health and safety policy template as well, I think. And a couple of other bits and bobs on there. You can also get free templates off the HSE. The HSE have a five step guide to risk assessment that's very useful. And for more complex ones, obviously we contact them. Um one of your colleagues. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which of you want to take this one on. Both of you have kind of mentioned it. Is it law to wear a quad bike helmet? And in, if not, in which situations would it not be? OK, I'm, I'm happy to take this one, actually. Um, a lot of research shows, actually, that people don't wear them they know important the importance of it but actually don't go with it actually under the health and safety act you know you have a duty of care to take the adequate responsibility for your own health and safety and not to do anything and not to remove anything but actually it's not written in law but it is implied and that's the that's the sort of guidance that hse would give that it's not a specific written in law it is in northern ireland actually but it's not in um, gb um, however, it is implied and it can be challenged under, um, I think it's Regulation 3 and also under the Health and Safety at Work Act as well. So it is providing yourself with the adequate um, PPE and protective wear in order to keep the, your member of your staff safe and also yourself. Anything to add? Other stuff. Everybody knows the importance of them, but I think, yeah, I think you're right. There's not as big an uptake as there there should be, and everybody does know the know the risks. That there isn't. I think a, a lot of the arguments I hear against it is that they can't hear properly when they're wearing one, or it's obstructing their vision. But actually, there's some very good ATV helmets available where the actual earpiece is cut out, so your hearing isn't impaired. Um, and, the, and there's some really good ones out there. Uh, and the, the end of the day, it's going to save a life if you wear it. Yeah, very true. Right, I think if, unless anybody else wants to put a quick question up, I think we've answered all the... Somebody said something about whether or not we had any contacts in Orkney. Yep. Um, actually... No, at the moment, we don't. We would welcome them. Um, but, you know, the I think the 
the people that we have in terms of ambassadors would be just people that are right throughout the country. We welcome ambassadors, so we would be happy enough to speak to anybody. In terms, I know in Shetland Island, the Mind Your Head um, charity itself is a small charity, but it covers forests, um, fisheries and farming. So they cover all three in terms of support. Um, but as far as Orkney, um, I know that it's not something that we have at the moment, but we would welcome it. Can I just, oh, I'll jump on and mention one yeah. thing I think we've not talked about is the HSE website have an agricultural bulletin that you can sign up for and they send out email updates and that can include things like what they're focusing on with their inspections and any kind of changes to legislation. So you can sign up for that on the HSE website, which can be a really good way to kind of find out what the HSE are focusing on in the agricultural side. Previously, they've come out and said, for example, that they're looking at potato farms in Perth and different things that they're going to focus on. So it can be quite a good um, free way to keep up to date on a regular basis. Perfect. If anybody wants to do that, feel free to drop me an email and I can pass the details on to Laura. And I'm sure she can get you get you added on. All right, we'll just move through the slides quickly. Right, so I would just like to thank um, our speakers this evening, all three of them have obviously got a wealth of knowledge. So Laura, Steph and Steph just um, have made my life much more trying this evening. Um, <laughs> they all showed a huge knowledge of their topic. And yeah, if there is any other queries, they would, uh, I'm sure they would answer them um, through email. So if you drop me a message, that's fine. I'd also like to thank the Farm Advisory Service. They, um, they provide the, the support for, for carrying out these meetings. Um, and I have one almost big from you all. You'll get an email within the next 24 hours for to complete the event survey. Um, not only does it get you into the prize draw for these lovely prizes that you'll see on screen, that um, you see the, the past winner there, but it also is valuable feedback. So if there's anything you think we should do differently, any topics you want covered, anything like that, we do look at the feedback and um, act on it. So if you could do that, that would be great. Um, and finally, yeah, there's my contact details. So if you want to give me a shout for anything I can up with, with any of the speakers this evening, or if you have any questions or queries, or you missed that links that Mary sent out, just um, give me a shout and we can uh, we can get that organised for you. And I just, uh, I would normally say, wish you a safe journey home when I'm having meetings and I still haven't got used to not doing that. But yeah, have a good evening and you can uh, return to your, return to your uh, evening's duties. Thanks very much. <laughs>